Families, friends, esteemed faculty and staff, welcome to Yale College Class Day. And most importantly, to the class of 2021, on behalf of me, Sky, Stephen, Jin, and Stanley, we just want to say congratulations. For over 100 years, Yaleys have come together and celebrated our graduating class one last time on class day. I don't need to tell you that this year's ceremony, much like our senior year, looks a little different from its predecessors. But in today's festivities, we hope to replicate and renovate many of Yale's most cherished traditions. We'll start today off with a series of speeches from graduates and alumni. V. Tran will open our ceremony with the Ivy Ode. Then we'll hear from acclaimed songwriter Bobby Lopez, our senior class counsel, and a comedic reflection by Matt Nadell and Teava Torres de Sa. To cap off the day and our time at Yale, Alex Zabornak will deliver a reflection on these last four years we've shared together. But before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to walk you through some of the items you received yesterday. The Class Anthology, produced by Sky Ward, details our time together in a series of essays and works of art. The Church Warden Pipe, a tradition that dates back to the 1860s, used to symbolize the end of a carefree college life, as successive generations of Yaleys would form circles and crush the pipes into the earth. The Sprig of Ivy ties us back to the ceremonial planting of the Class Ivy, a tradition that began way back in 1852, to symbolize the abiding legacy of our contributions to the college, even long after we graduate. And lastly, the Yale Handkerchief, which Sky will tell you more about at the end of our ceremony here today. Yale has changed a lot since these traditions first began. It's even changed in the few short years that we've been a part of it. But there are some parts of it that will always remain constant. Here to remind us of this enduring spirit of Yale is V. Tran, a senior in Branford College studying ethnicity, race, and migration with our Ivy Ode. There's a specific feeling of coming back to campus after being gone for a while. Sometimes it's been a long Uber ride from Hartford or LaGuardia or JFK. Sometimes it's an Uber ride after a train ride into Union Station. Sometimes it's in a car your family's driving in that you've known your entire life. Sometimes it's in a car you're driving in with your friends coming back from a trip you're still trying to revel in and your body is itching to get up because you've been sitting for hours. And pulling through Chapel or York or Elm, you know the streets, but they also feel a little bit different this time. It's the same feeling of walking into your childhood home after six months in New Haven and swearing that your head is a tiny bit closer to the ceiling. It's the same feeling as hugging your family again and wanting to show them that you're a little bit different, but that you're also the same. There's a specific feeling of hearing a voice you love pop up in your common room. It's Thursday and you hear your sweet door open and close and you think it's your sweet mate just coming back from the bathroom, but it's actually someone else. There's a specific joy at hearing a voice that isn't coming out of your computer speakers. It's the same feeling as hearing one of your favorite songs start to play at a party, remember those? Or on the radio in the car, or on your friend's phone that's connected to the Bluetooth speaker in the living room. And as many times as I've heard Carrie Underwood's Before He Cheats or Sage the Gemini's Gas Pedal, the songs never don't hit. It's the same feeling as hearing that one of your friends got that job they were excited for and you are so excited for everything that's coming their way. There's a specific feeling of seeing one of your favorite people on cross campus looking cute and all. You see someone you're pretty sure is who you think it is, but especially now with masks, I really don't know if we're on the high level or if we're on the walk past each other and act like we're looking at something over there level. But sometimes it really is someone you know and love and can be excited for unabashedly, and they're excited to see you too. It's the same feeling as seeing red chat pop up in your Zoom because someone has DM'd you. And it's the feeling of watching your friends smile at your message and response, or both of you covering your faces and turning your cameras off because you're laughing at the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's the same feeling as losing your person at a party or a weird Yale event that you're much more socially anxious about than you're willing to admit. But then you turn around and you see them and they were looking for you too. 
A while ago, I was coming back from retreat with a wonderful group of people. And on the way back to New Haven, someone was like, what if X person had come? Do you think that would have made any difference? And then someone was like, of course, they always make it. Everyone makes a difference. And I think about that a lot because especially at a place like Yale, it's so easy to think that you could go missing for a few days and no one would notice. And every other day for the past four years, I've thought about disappearing to go live on a farm and paint and read books and sit with goats. But if there's anything I've learned at Yale, it's that I am only a sum of everyone that I've ever loved. No one here knows what they're doing or who they are or what they want in life. The things that we think are worth it and the things that we're taught will satisfy us and the job and this salary and all these other things that we think Yale is supposed to be for, don't make Yale Yale. And in reality, the things that make Yale Yale are the people that we love and the ways that we love them. We look forward to the little things with them. We look forward to seeing if there's bacon at brunch, if your house favorite will win The Bachelor, they don't. If that thing you ordered has finally come into the packaging center, and if it's finally gonna be nice enough this weekend to go to the farmer's market in Wooster with your friends like you always say you want to. And in truth, life a week from now could be exactly the same or drastically different. And while we don't always know what we're doing, we do know what we feel. We feel happy and sad and stressed and exhausted and tired of the snow and tired of the cold. We feel joy and pride and love and loneliness and like we're growing up too fast and there's no way to stop the train. But if you look outside, you'll see that the view is beautiful. There's a specific feeling of leaving campus after being here for a while. And when I next see Elm Street, I will feel older. There's that weird conversation starter that's like, if you could say anything to your younger self, what would you say? And I think I would say, I'm so proud. We've come so far and done so much and loved so widely and so deeply, and there's even more to come. It's the same feeling as packing up your suitcase for the end of the semester or the end of Yale now, and realizing that you're not the same person you were when you came here freshman year. It's the same feeling as taking down all your photos and all your posters off your wall and thinking, I'm gonna miss this place. There's a specific feeling of leaving campus after being here for a while. And I think it's called growing up and leaving home. And I wouldn't wanna do it anywhere else. Much love to the class of 2021. Love y'all, we did it. We are delighted to announce our renowned Class Day speaker, Robert Lopez, Yale College, Class of 1997. Lopez is a two-time Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony award-winning songwriter. After graduating from Yale College in 1997 with a bachelor's degree in English, he joined the BMI Musical Theater Workshop, where he met future collaborators, Jeff Marks, with whom he co-created the multiple Tony award-winning Avenue Q, and Kristen Anderson, now Kristen Anderson Lopez, his wife and co-writer. The couple's partnership produced the songs from Frozen, Frozen 2, and Marvel's WandaVision, as well as the song Remember Me from Coco. Lopez is also the co-creator with Matt Stone and Trey Parker of South Park fame of the Book of Mormon, which debuted in 2011 and won nine Tony Awards. He shared two Emmy Awards for his music on Nickelodeon's The Wonder Pets, as well as Emmy nominations for songs in Scrubs, the 87th Academy Awards ceremony, and the mockumentary, The Comedians. His work has been featured on the television shows South Park, The Simpsons, and Phineas and Ferb. Lopez is one of only 15 artists to win all four major entertainment industry awards, Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. He was also the youngest to do so at age 39 in 2014, and the first to win all four a second time. He's been an amazing ambassador for the artistic talents and activities that are such a big part of the Yale experience. Without further ado, please help me welcome Robert Lopez. Hello, congratulations, and happy class day, Yale College class of 2021. I wanna thank President Salovey and everyone at Yale for the honor of speaking to you today. Actually, this is gonna be taped over many days and I have a lot of these shirts, so I think that we will be fine with the illusion of continuity. 
So my class day in 1997, it rained, and we all sat in chairs for hours with umbrellas, which is something I've never done since. I hope it doesn't rain today, but if it does, please take my advice and don't be talked into sitting outside, even with an umbrella, you will still get wet. My name is Robert Lopez, everyone calls me Bobby. I'm a songwriter and I'm here because the administration and the class day committee now prefers musical theater professionals to the typical intellectual, historian, politician, writer, or entrepreneur they usually get. And well, they should because at this crossroads of history, a little musical theater might be just the thing for all of us. And they hinted, not so subtly, that I work some songs into my remarks. And for the majority of you who are like, who the F is this guy? Here is a hint. This is a rewrite of one of my songs to forever musicalize the moment President Salave asked me to do this. Do you want to speak on class day? I think it would be fun. I know it's not your superpower to talk for half an hour in front of everyone. But it would be exciting. And just think of all the lessons you'd like to teach. Yes, I guess I'll speak on class day. And I guess I'll write this class day. Long speech. Today is class day. It's a celebration of the four years you've spent at Yale. New Haven's changed a lot since my class day 24 years ago. Mostly it's better. Really the only thing I miss is the Yankee Doodle, an old fashioned lunch counter that served magical burgers and fried buttered donuts. God, that place was great. I'd go in the early, early morning for breakfast sandwiches after pulling an all-nighter, the only time I ever got to hang out with people from the crew team. I'll never forget there was this one all-nighter I pulled. I was writing some paper and my, I left my computer on. I used to really go through despair while writing long papers and I needed food to sustain my spirits. So I came back to my room with a soda and a bag of chips and I sat back down at my desk and where my paper had left off, there were now like a bunch of random letters like XDFGKL semicolon slash slash. I thought that's weird. And then I noticed that some tissues from a box on my desk had been shredded. Then I looked at my window and there was some loose dirt and an acorn there. And then right on the ledge of the open window, a squirrel sat there, tensely looking back at me. I screamed a blood curdling sound that probably woke up the entire building and the squirrel jumped out the window onto a tree branch and never returned. Honestly, I thought about this a lot and I think it was a Disney moment that I was too high strung at the time to really appreciate. I mean, I was stuck on a paper and a freaking squirrel came in and typed something on my keyboard. And I just screamed and deleted what he typed. I mean, can you imagine the song that the squirrel would eventually have sung if I'd only thanked him and let him stay? Anyway, I think the gist of what I wanna talk about today is accepting help from the squirrel friends that the universe provides accepting collaboration into your life. The week before my class day, we had something called Senior Week. I'm not sure if you guys were able to have that this year, but back in my day, you were supposed to take a fun trip with your best friends to like Myrtle Beach and party all week. I was in the acapella group, the Spizwinks, and I and my two best friends from my class in the Winks, John and Brian, were sort of late to figure out what we were gonna do. And we ended up going to Maine which in May that year was really cold and really damp. The cabin we rented had a sign bearing its name, which was, it'll do. And as we sat and froze and did jigsaw puzzles, the whole thing felt like a bit of a metaphor for what we thought life was about to serve us. I think we were afraid we were going to graduate and go our separate ways and forget each other. And that the real world was gonna be like, it'll do in May 97, cold, damp, and depressing. I think we were afraid we'd be lonely, that it was about to be me against the world. Well, first of all, I could not have gotten through this pandemic without John and Brian. Every Tuesday for the last year, we got on Zoom and had a scotch and helped each other deal with whatever we had to deal with. We've been to each other's weddings. We've watched our kids be born. I mean, a lot of my Yale friends and I have stuck together and worked together too. And the real world may be tough, but it was not lonely. 
Sometimes school with grades and tests makes you feel like work is something you do alone. But my experience is that work can't be done without collaborators. I'm gonna talk out of my butt for a moment. A great surgeon has a team of doctors and nurses in the operating room with them. A CEO has to manage vice presidents and satisfy the board of directors. A professor works within their department. A great novelist allows a trusted circle of friends and ultimately an editor to read early drafts and give them necessary feedback. You get the idea. I don't think there is any field you can go into in which you can succeed without working with others. You guys have had collaborators your whole life without knowing it. Your first collaborators were your family. When you were a baby, you were totally dependent on your parents. But without knowing it, you were teaching them too, testing them through your utter dependence, forcing them to learn responsibilities and solve problems and gain skills they never would have learned without a crying baby, helping them to level up to be able to parent a toddler, then a child, then a tween, then a teen, and now finally a 20-something. You and your family work together to raise you, to get you into Yale and get you out of Yale. They are incredible collaborators, and they deserve credit for you as much as you do for them. You guys should thank each other today. Your classmates here at Yale are collaborators too. You've worked in the residential colleges together, making life better for each other. You've worked together to plan events like parties and dances and protests. You've worked together on sports teams. I didn't do that at Yale. You've worked together in acapella groups, in theater, did both of those. In newspapers, comedy groups, political clubs, ethnic, religious, and racial identity forums, LGBTQ+, even secret societies, all of these things are examples of collaboration. You've been practicing it this whole time. And when I was preparing for the speech, I met with a faculty member and the student committee for class day, and I realized another thing you've been collaborating on. Reimagining Yale within the realities of COVID. You guys know much more about what that's been like than I do. And from what I've heard, it's been very difficult and stressful. But I just want to underline how much collaborative work it's taken you all to make this past year a reality. And I want to say I'm amazed by it. I feel like sometimes the subtext of education is become well-rounded, be skilled in everything, don't have weaknesses, be a Rhodes Scholar, be incredible which I think in many ways is a great message in that it leads to you working to better yourself, which is really important. But at some point, you know, everyone has weaknesses. It's called being human. After you graduate, you may struggle in the real world for a few years. I certainly did. I bumped up big time into my weaknesses. I tend to be shy and introvert. My daughter says I'm INFP. My wife says I'm a typical Pisces. And when I graduated, the buzzword for how to get ahead was networking. Everyone said network, 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 which to me sounded awful. The thought of going to cocktail parties and walking up to people and giving them my card, I would just rather do anything other than that. My other weakness was that I still wasn't fully baked as a songwriter. Since I was 13 years old, I had been writing songs that were very good, but very good imitations of Stephen Sondheim, like this one. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got wonderful news for you. We're about to start. I didn't yet have a voice of my own. So even if I did give someone my card or my demo tape and they heard my songs, they'd be like, that's great. It sounds like Stephen Sondheim. It's okay to have weaknesses. It's okay to be shy. It's okay to not be fully baked as a songwriter. It's okay to have a hard time writing a 25 minute long speech. Because if you find community and if you find collaborators, you can partner with people who are strong in the areas you struggle in. I joined a class that taught musical theater writing called the BMI Musical Theater Workshop. And my classmates in that class became my friends and collaborators and helped me find my voice as a writer. My collaborator, Jeff Marks, was the kind of person who thrived on networking, who loved promoting our team and never felt self-conscious handing anyone a demo tape. Writing in the same room with Jeff brought out a different side of my personality, one that was more like who I was making jokes and laughing with the spizwings at Yale. 
So instead of my default, which was to write like Sondheim, I ended up having a lot more fun. And what we wrote came out fresher and more real. And together, we wrote a show that was inspired by a lot of the feelings we were both having struggling in the real world. And that show went to Broadway. In that show, Avenue Q, a puppet has just graduated college and is standing on the stage in cap and gown holding his degree. He is meant to be just like you guys, except a little bit lamer. His name is Princeton. What do you do with the B? I have no skills yet The world is a big scary place But somehow I can't shake The feeling I might make A difference to the human race I think in this moment of commencement and a new chapter of life beginning for all of you. There's also the illusion of a starter pistol going off and a mad dash to market yourself and sell what you have and what you are. And there's a lot of truth to this metaphor. And a lot of what's great about America lies in that race and the spirit of trying to outshine the competition and sparkle the brightest. Many, if not all of you, are indeed special sparkly diamonds discovered by the Yale Admissions Department and cut and polished by four years of education, now looking to be set in gorgeous fine jewelry. Some of you may prefer a more masculine image and you can feel free to invent that on your own. At any rate, what I'm trying to say is that talent, craft, and ability need to be channeled into purpose. Of course, you are all talented in your particular way or you wouldn't be here. For me, I tried to write the cleverest lyrics with puns and jokes and inner rhymes I would search for new chords I'd never heard before in a song, musical flourishes and crazy rhythms that would stand out. And now when I listen to that old stuff, I cringe because it's just all about trying to attract attention and show off. The subtext of it was hire me. It was an immature way of writing and it had no purpose beyond itself. The true purpose of music is not to serve yourself, but give something real and emotional to your fellow human being. And I learned this not from my parents, not from a teacher, not from a friend, but from a paper I wrote about Shakespeare's Tempest in my senior year of Yale. This was my senior thesis in English, and I promise you I did not approach it with the idea of learning anything. I was just trying to fulfill the requirement, get my degree, and get on with it. So in The Tempest, there's a character named Prospero, a powerful magician who lives in exile on an island. And he has this servant named Ariel, who is sort of a fairy spirit made of air. Prospero sends Ariel out to do his magical bidding and influence the other characters on the island. His purpose being complicated, but basically to redeem himself by creating harmony in the lives of the other characters. And Ariel is always singing and in many ways represents music. In my research, I found that in the Renaissance, the line between academic professor and magician was blurry as was the line between music and magic. And I came across the work of a Renaissance philosopher named Ficino, who was famous for singing magical songs and whose idea was that music was a form of airy spirit, kind of like Ariel, that could fly between the singer and us and influence our own spirits because both were made of the same thing, air. The word inspire itself was very central to all of this. Anyway, I don't think it was a great paper. I didn't even pick it up to see my grade or read the comments because I was kind of ashamed of how half-baked it was. But for the rest of my life, every time I've sat down to write a song, it's never been about trying to get hired or get noticed. I think about the magic power that music has to heal, to inspire, to influence, to ensnare, all those things that Prospero could do 
music can do. And ever since I started doing that, ever since I started trying to reach out with music and help people with it, like magic, I started being more successful. I think this is true of anything any of you want to do in life. It needs to be of service to the community. It needs to fulfill a function to make people's lives better in some way. And if it does that, people will value it and people will value you. Kristen and I were thinking about this idea when we wrote the song Remember Me from Coco. The first time we heard it, the first time we hear it in the movie, the great Ernesto de la Cruz is singing a farewell to the audience, showing off for the ladies and hamming it up. Remember me, that kind of thing. But later we hear, spoiler alert, that the song was not written by Ernesto, but by a poor musician named Hector that was forced to leave his wife and little daughter when he went out on the road and wrote her a lullaby to make sure she always knew he always loved her, even when he was away. Remember me, though I have to say goodbye. Remember me, don't let it make you cry. For even if I'm far away, I hold you in my heart. I sing a secret song to you each night we are apart. Remember me, though I have to travel far. Remember me Each time you hear a sad guitar Know that I'm with you The only way that I can be Until you're in my arms again Remember me So when you sit down to work on something with someone, what's the worst thing that can happen? Is it that the work goes badly? That you waste a few hours or even a whole day making something you aren't proud of? Or is it that you might hurt the feelings of the person you're working with? So the rule I had always operated by, which seemed logical to my ambitious, driven, stressed out Yale brain, was that the most important thing when you sit down to write a song is the song. As long as the song turns out great, anything goes. Which meant for me and my collaborators, we had to have any power struggle, painful criticism, or knock down, drag out fight that could help the song. Things took as long as they took, and our feelings weren't important. And operating by this rule, I wrote lots of good songs with lots of great people. But I noticed that those collaborations tended to run into trouble long term when bad feelings would accumulate over time. So one day, Kristen and I were writing a song on a particular project, and we were having our usual fight for control. And I told myself, today, Kristen matters more than this song. I won't stifle myself creatively, but I won't fight for anything. And we'll try every idea that everyone has. Who cares if you write a bad song? So Kristen said, I want to use the four chords of awesome. For those of you who don't know, those are the pop hit chords, the one, five, minor six, four. And I had never allowed us to use them because I thought they were like musical MSG, just too easy. But today we were gonna try every idea and I knew she was going for something. And this is what we wrote when I decided to treat Kristen as more important than the song we were writing. Let it go, let it go. I am one with the wind and sky. Let it go. like the 
bother me anyway. That song was more fun to write than anything we'd ever written. It was a joyful, happy process. And it allowed Kristen's perspective as an artist and a feminist to change the world a teeny bit. The people you work with are always more important than the work you're doing. There is only benefit when you value them that way. So, I've talked a lot today about collaboration. I hope it's been helpful, and I hope you go out there and knock our socks off. I know you will. Like everything else I've ever done, I had help with this, and I want to end by thanking everyone who helped me get this speech together. Yale and President Salave for asking me to do it, Allison Coleman and the students on the class day committee who coached me on it, my friends, my family, my kids, and especially my closest collaborator, my partner and wife, Kristen Anderson Lopez. No Kristen, no speech. And finally, that squirrel from my dorm room, well, it's taken me 24 years, but to thank him, I have finally memorialized him with his own Disney-style song, where he sings his message to me. And I'd like to sing it now for you to close this out as sort of a squirrely benediction on what has been an amazing day. Don't give up when you're stuck. Take my help. What the f I may be just a squirrel. But damn it, girl, I'll help you through Help me help you Don't be above collaboration After your graduation Be someone else a squirrel Give that tail a swirl and help them too Help them help you You've been through more than anyone He'll call class of 21 bright college years with pleasure rife the shortest gladdest years of life now go into the world but do it squirreled you'll sail right Hello, class of 2021. I'm Brian Owens, your class secretary. And I'm Curtis Colvett, your class treasurer. And we are both very excited to share this day with you. Class of 2021, what a privilege it's been to be the historic largest class ever to enter Yale College. We are essentially the vanguard of a new era at Yale. A new era, not because Yale has fundamentally changed, but because it has grown. To become more inclusive, more accessible, and to offer more opportunity for all. Case in point, even in 2017, when we were freshmen, Durfee Market um, expanded its meal swipe from $8 to $9. And many other wonderful uh, changes and developments have been happening all around us. We were the first class to live all four years in Ben Franklin and Pauley Murray Colleges. Simultaneously, facilities all around campus have been expanding and shifting their roles. Schwartzman Center, which has been closed essentially since we've been here, uh, will nonetheless open very soon to students for generations to come. Science Hill has all kinds of new facilities for state-of-the-art research. The Tobin Economic Center will soon open. The future of Yale looks really bright, and it's a privilege to have been one of the first classes to experience Yale in this new phase. When we think back to Yale, we will inevitably remember the trials and tribulations of the past four years, and especially of the past year and a half. Our class braved this once-in-a-century pandemic, and we've grown resilient because of it. We created ways to ensure that social distancing did not mean becoming antisocial. Let's catch up after the pandemic became the new, let's grab a meal sometime. And we survived months of Zoom lectures, lying in bed, half awake, camera off, and microphone muted. And this weekend, we're gonna be saying goodbye to our time living in these 14 residential colleges. The memories and the friendships are gonna last a lifetime but this constant closeness of being together in one uh, nice, beautiful town is, is going away. We'll remember the professors who have shaped our lives, the faculty and staff who have taken care of us, and 
all those conversations that we had at random times in the day and night, um, being in the basement of Bass um, and being in the slightly less dark upstairs of Bass, possibly even walking down what Mark Twain once called the most beautiful street in America, Hill House Avenue. Many of us will feel a wistful emptiness as we lose our core identity of being a Yale student. But our connections with Yale will only grow stronger as we build our new identities as Yale alumni. We will join a group of people dedicated to service, leadership, and education. And if there's anything that COVID has taught us, it is that we are all in this together. So please, stay in touch with the people who have touched your lives. And at the same time, make new friends at your regional Yale clubs and alumni interest groups. Even consider becoming a mentor to the next classes of Yaleys. And of course, we welcome you to join us at our class of 2021 alumni events. We hope to see you there. We'd like to take one last second to thank the family and friends who devoted their time and energy to making us into the adults that we are today. They've shaped the class of 2021 in so many wonderful ways. We'd also like to thank the Yale administration for sticking with us in this difficult year and helping us to make the most out of it, for ensuring that we had a safe, fun, and memorable senior year. But above all, it's been our pleasure to serve as your senior class offices, officers. Once again, Congratulations, Congratulations and, and good, good luck, luck to, to the, the class, class of 2021. Hey everyone, obviously Harvard Yale is one of the best weekends of the year and some of my fondest memories from first year actually with Angelica and Lauren was waiting in line for the bus to the stadium for over an hour and I may or may not have ordered and canceled three or four Ubers. <laughs> it's just one of those Yale traditions that really brings everyone together. You look up when you're sitting in the student section and realize that you're part of this amazing community and that you have so much to be grateful for. And of course, we all missed it this year, but we will for sure be back next, remembering that the weekend is a marathon and not a sprint. <laughs>
Your dad was in the common room putting together a Sandbakken from Ikea. Your mom was disinfecting every bathroom in Bingham Hall. And you were beginning a lifelong friendship that would definitely never become hostile. I certainly remember it. For me and Matt, it was love at first sight. I mean, <laughs> Tinder? <laughs> Ship? Data mash? Forget them! If you really want to find love, put your faith in Jeremiah Quinlan and the Yale housing algorithm. To clarify, we're not actually lovers, we're best friends. In fact, a few months after meeting Matt, I started dating his best friend, and we've been together ever since. Boy, has that been convenient for the three of us. Yup, the three of us. All three of us. Convenient for all three of us equally. Unlike Tayaba, I didn't have the good fortune of finding true love in my first year at Yale. I, I trust we've all seen To All the Boys I've Loved before. My love life was more like To All the Boys I've Met at Wodes, who puked on my rug and cried about their ex in my bed. I mean, clearly one in four is not enough. Oh, Matt, come on, it's their loss. You're a catch. Thank you. You know, I have to admit, I was jealous our first semester when I opened Rumpus and saw Tayava on the 50 most beautiful people at Yale list. But now, I understand my worth. I may not be 50 most hot, but I'm Haas Family Library hot, which is Sterling Frumpy and Bass Cafe Basic, but CTL sexy. Ah, the CTL, where I pulled an all-nighter and had a meltdown in front of my foot leader. Foot? I almost forgot. Yale's favorite cult, providing fertilizer to the Appalachian Trail since 1701. You know, I almost did foot, but I actually broke my foot. Oh, I'm sad you never got to meet your footies. Right? But you know who I did get to meet? My Froco group, and my TF, and my ULA, and my CCE, and my CHE, and my PL. Peer liaison. And my PL. Personal librarian. And of course, my SSRI. Selective serotonin reuptake. The Summer Science Research Institute. Yes, sir. And speaking of science, can I hear it for all my pre-meds out there? Look at you with your lab coats and employable skills. <laughs> Look, I know you're at home, but if you're pre-med, I want you to raise your hand proud. Great. Now please keep your hand up if you are available for free or low-cost tutoring. I am still trying to finish my science credit. Now, now, now. Matt's modest, so here's something he won't tell you. He's an amazing student. Since meeting Matt, I now have an organized calendar, better study habits, and <gasps> crippling imposter syndrome. Okay. You know what I'm talking about. Now if Yale really wants to make us normies feel comfortable on this campus, all they need to do is put people like Matt in standalone singles and not let them speak in section. And, and just to piggyback off that, I had some tough nights at Yale. I'm sure you did too. But in those moments of despair, we must remember, we have a resource. The Good Life Center. Feeling down? Play in a sandbox. Accidentally called your professor mom? Touch a succulent. Submitted fan fiction instead of an essay? Hawk Santos says chai on tap. <laughs> and you know who else at Yale has got your back? who will be there for you day and night. Your personal librarian. Your personal librarian. In fact, I... Oh, Tayava, should I? Matt, she's gonna love it! Okay. I actually wrote a poem in honor of my personal librarian, so, um... Lori Bronars, <laughs> this haiku is for you. <clears throat> Orbis was no help. Needed newspaper records. Emailed you midnight. Please help bad grade fail class. No job law school. Dad's pride. Oh, right. <laughs> you didn't like it? I would critique your poetry, but I haven't read a book since I was 10 years old. Tava! What? I expected to read books at Yale. I expected I'd spend hours reading the most prolific authors in history. William Shakespeare, Virginia Woolf, Toni Morrison. But instead, I spent hours reading COVID emails from Melanie Boyd, Marvin Chun, and Stephanie Spangler. And that's not Yale's only false promise. Yale tells you that you'll meet the next John Kerry or Meryl Streep, but you're much more likely to meet their art major grandchild in a pregame you weren't invited to. Yeah, I expected to meet the rich and famous, but all I've gotten is a $6 Venmo request from a billionaire's child for Franzia. Of course, the biggest broken promise came on our first day at Yale. In a speech in Woolsey Hall, Dean Chun told us not to worry about getting straight A's. You can get a couple B's and C's. But what he didn't anticipate is that we'd all be getting P's. Thank you, no fail Yale. The pandemic has indeed presented many obstacles, but we've adapted our senior year to Zoom. We've gone to Zimprov shows and Zoga classes. Zaked parties and disciplinary hearings. But most of all, we've gone to Zale Zental Health and Zanseling. Uh, group therapy, of course. <laughs> We missed out on a lot of senior traditions. Society parties, masquerade, last chance dance. But if there's one senior tradition that's endured these tough times, it's Feb Club. You know what we're talking about. And in our apartment, we found ourselves celebrating March Club. 
April Club, and we are in the midst of a thrilling May Club right now. Right now. But here's the thing. Even when we're seniors no more, there's a club to which we will all belong. The Yale Club, where for $1,000 a night, you can get a New York City hotel room that reminds you of a Welch single. So, win your Tonys, cure your patience, save the world. The class of 2021 will scatter the globe after we leave campus, but we will always be united in our memories. We will always be the class that paid full tuition to watch a sterling professor speak on mute for 15 minutes. We'll always be the class that lost commons, Wall Street pizza, and of course, Myrtle Beach, which no one would go to against COVID regulations. Right? And we'll always be the class that made it out in one piece with the same top of the line education our predecessors enjoyed and some top of the line mRNA they couldn't have imagined. Thank you. When I think about the student organizations here, I think about family and camaraderie. I also think about the ways in which we all come together from such diverse backgrounds to unite with the same passions and interests. For me, I've met some of my dearest and closest friends throughout my time in these organizations, and I'll forever be grateful for that. For me, two organizations that stand out in particular are DanceWorks and Yale Steppin' Out. These are two organizations that are part of the greater dance community here at Yale, and I'll really remember every single rehearsal and performance I've done in these groups because these have really helped me cultivate deeper and meaningful connections with people. And I also think that there's something so beautiful with the energy that's created every single time there's a performance because it's such a safe and welcoming space, and I'll really miss that. back on your past four years at Yale. Did they turn out the way you expected? How has Yale changed you? And how have you changed Yale? And are you proud of what you've made of your four years here? As you listen to the final speech of this year's Class A program, I encourage you to consider and reflect on your own college years and what it means for you to be a Yale-y. Without further ado, I'm beyond excited to present to you this year's serious reflection given by Alex Zabornak, a humanities major of Ezra Stiles College. My first winter break at Yale, I flew to Hawaii with my improv group on tour. And on our third day, as we were coming back from an adventure to a roaring waterfall, we happened to stumble upon a rainbow. Immediately, we pulled over, got out of the car, and as if on cue, all started sprinting towards it. Cheering and jumping and throwing our fists in the air like we were crazy, we ran towards what felt like the perfect ending to the perfect day. But as we tried getting closer and closer, the rainbow kept slipping further away from us. Three winter breaks have come and gone since that tour, but the memory feels especially relevant now. Each of us has spent the past four years running towards our beautiful Yale finales. Every 1 a.m. paper in Bass, every late night grilled cheese in the buttery, every performance, every game, every test has been another step closer to our senior springs, to a colorful time that's supposed to be saturated with friends and parties and graduation. And then came the pandemic, and a lot of things changed about Yale. No more in-person classes, no Harvard Yale, no masquerade, no spring fling. It's hard not to focus on all the loss. It's hard not to feel like just when we are finally going to reach our rainbow, it slipped away. But the more I think about it, the more I realize it's always been this way. Even before the pandemic, from the moment we first set foot on campus, there's always been things that we wanted to do, 
but couldn't. In fact, there are whole boards filled with them. You can't go more than 100 feet without running into one of these giant rectangular bulletin boards on campus. Inside, outside, old campus, cross campus, even behind toads. And each is filled to the brim with an array of glistening flyers and posters. In our first years, my friends and I would stand in front of those boards forever, taking photos of all the things that we wanted to do. Improvaganza, treasures from the Yale Film Archive, talk like a pirate day, wilderness first aid course, learn to curl. It was a mosaic of opportunities, and, and just when we thought that we'd done them all, someone would come and staple a fresh batch. Civil Disobedience 101, Yale Photo Society, Fall Exhibition, Perform with Yale Children's Theater, Conversations with Vice President Al Gore, The Silliman Haunted House is Back. Our camera rolls quickly turned into a technicolor patrick of club meetings and events and performances. But as we soon realized, we just couldn't do them all. Even this year, with everything that's changed, there's still so many things that we can't do here. Things that we want to do, things that we wish we had the time to do, but things that we simply can't do. The performance of our friend's one-person show interferes with the Ezra Stiles hike to East Rock, the YSO concert with the CCAM virtual reality workshop, the I Am Spikeball tournament with the Fall Foliage Tour, do we want free cannolis in the courtyard or free chicken nuggets on cross campus? Do we attend the virtual college tea with the creator of Avatar The Last Airbender or with the Nobel Laureate? Even now, there's so much to do, so many people to meet and friendships to solidify. I still think about that rainbow in Hawaii a lot, though. There's just something so Yale about it. From the time that we were wide-eyed first years, we've been chasing the perfect college experience, where we do everything, take advantage of every opportunity that Yale has to offer. Where, by our senior springs, we could be editor-in-chief of the YDN, president of the YCC, first chair of the YSO, and quarterback of the football team, with four Ivy League championship rings on our finger and a diploma reading ultra mega summa cum laude in our hands. Where we've gone in every study abroad fellowship, watched and performed in every show, and met and become best friends with everyone. Where we've checked off every flyer from that bulletin board. But that's impossible. It's impossible to catch the rainbow. Though, if we've learned anything from this year, it's that Yale isn't actually about catching the rainbow. Yale's about realizing, even if it takes four years and maybe a pandemic, that you can never catch it, and that that's okay. Yale's about discovering how you want to chase it. And it's about running and jumping and laughing with the people you love the entire way. Because it's lovely to chase rainbows, especially when the chase is as beautiful and vibrant and special as it was at Yale. It can feel a little cliche to talk about the importance of community at Yale, but the strength of those relationships really came through in the first few months of the pandemic when we were so suddenly dispersed and yet relied on each other anyway. And it was those types of moments like playing late night FIFA games with sweet mates, going on friends tours of the UAG, or celebrating blowout wins against Harvard on the sports fields, which build the types of relationships that make Yale so special and that I know can last a lifetime.
Hello Class of 2021, and on behalf of the Class Day Committee, we hope you've enjoyed this virtual version of Class Day and that you've been able to experience the feelings of camaraderie and joy that are at the heart of this celebration. A lot has changed from our first year to our last, and I don't just mean the pandemic that has tried to define our senior year in one way or another. Our class has been the first to do many things. The first to live in the brand new residential colleges that soon became home. The first to experience the best YSO Halloween show ever produced and the first to see Marvin Chun's grades. The class of 2021 is a group of incredible game changers, first leapers and modernizers. It's my favorite thing about our class, along with just how incredibly passionate, strange and unique we all are. And this class day is another example of how we get creative and incite change in whatever we touch. The traditions Akil talked about at the beginning are still present on this day, but we've made them our own. The ivy seeds you received are part of a long tradition, but this year you can take them wherever you go next, plant them in your new homes, and hopefully they'll remind you of the incredible last four years. The anthology that we put together also changed drastically, expanding to include different forms of expression and hopefully encompassing as many parts of our Yale experience as possible. One thing that hasn't changed though is the tradition of hearing bright college years at the beginning and end of our time at Yale and waving the handkerchief you received either yesterday or even four years ago. It's a heartwarming tradition that allowed us to say hello and now to say goodbye. Therefore, it's my honor to introduce the Yale Glee Club in a brand new performance of Bright College Years. And lastly, from all of us, congratulations class of 2021.